Okay, the room is now open. Good afternoon, and thank you for joining us today. The task force hopes that you are all safe and continuing to check the CDC's website for the latest information, guidelines, and resources. And in addition, we hope you're also checking our website at bia.gov front slash COVID-19 for additional updates relevant to Indian country from Indian Affairs. Uh, to formally begin, my name is Tara Sweeney. I am the Assistant Secretary for Indian Affairs at the U.S. Department of the Interior. Uh, today is the eighth listening session that the task force has held since beginning work in February 2020. We appreciate the interest of tribal leaders and others in joining this call and that the information shared here today is very important and valuable. In honor of the United States government-to-government -government relationship, when it comes time for question and answer, I respectfully request that the questions come from tribal leaders for the first 30 minutes. Uh, the remaining time will then be for comments by other Indian country stakeholders. Uh, we ask that you keep comments to three minutes, given the number of participants the program that we are using will automatically mute a line at the three-minute mark. Uh, we have over 200 people registered for uh, this session, and so it's important that we uh, continue to uh, adhere to that three-minute mark uh, so that we can hear from as many individuals representing Indian country as possible during this time. Uh, a couple of routine housekeeping items include that when you wish to speak, please use the raise the hand button located in the drop down at the top of your screen, indicated by either a hand icon or the figure with the, the arm raised. Uh, your microphone will be unmuted when it is your turn. You can only speak if you if you have registered. Uh, when you are up to speak, please identify yourself with your name spelling, and the tribe or organization you represent. There's a three-minute timer, as I have mentioned before, and you should be able to see it at the bottom of your screen. Uh, for everyone's awareness, everything said during this telephonic uh, listening session will be recorded and become part of the final transcript. If you wish to provide written comments, please use the comment box uh, on, on your screen. If you wish to submit more detailed written comments, you can submit them directly to Operation Lady Justice at usdoj.gov. I'm also proud to announce that we've added a new section on the Operation Lady Justice website that features all of the publicly available information from the NCMEC missing less than six months, and NamUs missing more than six months, on missing American Indian and Alaska Native children. The link to the new section can be found on the Operation Lady Justice website, which is www.operationladyjustice.usdoj.gov. We will now share a short presentation about the executive order in Operation Lady Justice then turn to our participants for their comments and questions. It is now my honor to ask the White House personnel working with Operation Lady Justice to provide brief remarks. I'm proud to introduce the team within the Trump administration that has provided unwavering support across the federal government for Operation Lady Justice. Uh, first, I will introduce Ms. Brooke Rollins, Assistant to the President and Acting Director, Domestic Policy Council. Ms. Rollins. Operator, is Ms. Rollins available? Sorry, we're okay, trying to call her in. Oh, sorry. She should be on in just a second. It's dialing.
Can I have an update on Ms. Rollins, please? Yes, she just, um, the attendee just picked up. Ms. Rollins, are you there? Ms. Rollins? Hey, y'all, it's Brooke Rollins. Sorry about that. We were having some technical difficulties. Well, welcome to the listening session, Ms. Rollins. Well, thank you so much. It is an absolute honor to be with you all. I have the amazing Jenny Lichter here with me, uh, the deputy uh, deputy in uh, Domestic Policy Council. I know she's been working so hard on this and is so passionate about it. We also all know that this issue is of such importance to the president uh, and to our entire administration. After hearing concerns from tribal governments, he knew that he needed to take action. And as we all now know, which is why we're all on this call, signed the executive order to establish this task force uh, focusing on missing and murdered American Indians and Alaska Natives just last November. Uh, we're so grateful to all the leadership on the call. We know that these calls are vital for this task force to fulfill its mission. Um, most of you don't know, and there's no reason that you should, but I was named the acting director of the Domestic Policy Council now two or three weeks ago, but I have been with this White House for more than two years now running the Office of American Innovation and working on key legacy projects for the president. And now I'm so excited to have this, um, this project, which I also believe is a key legacy project uh, for this president as part of my portfolio as well. So I am on, Jenny is on, we're so happy to be here uh, and very grateful and we're just looking forward to listening. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Uh, I, at this time, I would also like to call on Ms. Uh, Rachel Collins, who's the Senior Policy Advisor for the Domestic Policy Council. Ms. Collins? Thank you, Tara. Hi, everyone. This is Rachel Collins. As she said, I'm also with the Domestic Policy Council and just want to echo the sentiments that Brooke just shared. We are um, excited to be on this call and look forward to hearing all of your comments. Thank you. Thank you. And at this time, I would like to introduce Mr. Doug Holscher. Deputy Assistant to the President and Director for the Office of Intergovernmental Affairs. Mr. Holscher? Um, we lost him on the line. He should be picking up. I know he was trying to call in, so just give him yes. maybe a second. Doug, Doug are Hi, you can you hear me? Yep, can you hear me? Yes, yes, go ahead. Okay, guys. all right, all right, thank you very much. I appreciate uh, the chance to join. I'm glad that Brooke was able to join. She's a great champion for uh, uh, looking out for all Americans. And the reason we're on this phone call today is because we all care deeply about the uh, long overlooked issue of missing and murdered American Indian and Alaska Natives. And so, um, I'm proud to work for uh, the president uh, that was the first president to formally acknowledge this as, a, as an important issue. Um, about a little over a year ago, he, signed, he was the first president to sign a proclamation, a presidential proclamation on the issue to elevate awareness and to, to shine a light uh, on a need to address this important issue. And then after a, a lot of uh, uh, coordination with stakeholders from both uh, HHS and DOJ and Department of Interior and the White House, um, the President last November uh, invited several uh, Native American leaders to join him in the Oval Office where he signed an executive order uh, creating this task force that's working with you today, that's learning from you today, um, that uh, created Operation Lady Justice and the work that uh, is ongoing and very important. Um, I wanted to just add a little bit more perspective on some of the, uh, the President's other uh, priorities in Indian country and, in, and serve uh, American uh, Indians and Alaska Natives more generally. Uh, last fall, the President announced that uh, uh, two important things. One, um, uh, the work of the Domestic Policy Council helped advance alongside a policy change on eagle feather remains, and so that uh, went into effect uh, last fall. A couple months later, uh, yet, yet last fall, uh, the President announced uh, on the state floor of the White House um, that uh, we had worked with Finland in a process to begin repatriating important uh, artifacts and cultural remains 
from uh, uh, that, that are very important to the Mesa Verde region. And, uh, and so that was something that the president was very uh, proud to accomplish uh, and, and make progress on. Also, the president uh, it, it signed an uh, uh, executive order creating uh, a task force on the Indian Health Service to make sure that Alaska Native and American uh, Indian uh, children are protected in the Indian Health Service. And those recommendations, I think, will be coming out in the near future. And so another issue that had been long overlooked by administrations of both parties and something that the president uh, cared a lot about and, and, and one wanted to focus on and make sure that that uh, systematic uh, abuse uh, doesn't happen ever again. And so, um, in short, uh, a lot of work uh, has gone on in the last year or two uh, to support Indian country. Um, Brooke, I'm sure, talked about opportunity zones and a variety of other things that we're doing to help disadvantaged communities around the country. Um, but again, coming back to the reason we're on this phone call today, the issue of missing and murdered uh, Alaska Native and American uh, uh, Indians is because uh, you all care about it. We care about it. We want to make progress, uh, both at DOJ, at the Department of Interior, HHS, the White House, the entire federal family. I uh, have to say one of the most moving experiences of my life was traveling to Alaska last year for uh, several listening sessions on this topic. And uh, it moved me in a powerful way, and I'm glad to stay involved in this important issue set. And thank you, and look forward to hearing your thoughts. Thank you, Mr. Holscher. We will continue along with the PowerPoint. Certainly appreciative of all of the support the, the Trump administration has provided uh, across the federal government for uh, support for Operation Lady Justice. And as you mentioned, uh, the signing of the Executive Order 13898 launched the Interagency Operation Lady Justice Task Force. The primary charge of the task force is to develop an aggressive government-wide strategy to improve federal, local, state, and tribal law enforcement cooperation to combat violence against women and youth in Native American com communities. Uh, we will establish protocols for new and unsolved cases, establish multi-jurisdictional cold case teams, improve the response to investigative challenges, and collect and manage data across jurisdictions. And at this time, I would like to introduce the task force uh, for those participating today. Um, I am Tara Sweeney, as I said, Assistant Secretary for Indian Affairs at the U.S. Department of the Interior. I am also Secretary Bernhardt's co-chair designee and the Attorney General's co-chair designee from the Department of Justice is Catherine Katie Sullivan. As you can see on the slide, she's the Principal Deputy Assistant Attorney General in the Office of Justice Programs. Uh, and sitting in for Katie today is Jessica Hart. Thank you, Tara. Good afternoon, everyone. As Tara said, I'm here representing Principal Deputy Assistant Attorney General and Operation Lady Justice Co-Chair Designee Katie Sullivan. My name is Jessica Hart. I'm the Director of the Office for Victims of Crime, which is within the Office of Justice Programs in the Department of Justice. Um, I'm so grateful, really, to have everyone here to speak with us today, and I'm especially grateful for your willingness and your openness to discuss this painful um, topic with us. And I know Attorney General Barr and Katie both value the importance of hearing from tribal members and professionals directly affected by this crisis. And that's why these listening sessions are just so important and valuable to the task force. The department remains committed to working with tribal leaders and with all law enforcement agencies to better understand this problem and develop more effective responses to turn this tide of violence. Um, so thank you again for being with us here today and allowing me to introduce myself. I'm excited to um, hear from all of you. Thanks so much. Thank you. And uh, representing the Federal Bureau of Investigations, we have Terry Wade as the Executive Assistant Director for Criminal Cyber Response and Services Branch. Representing Mr. Wade on the task force today is Jay Greenberg. Thank you, Tara. Good afternoon, everybody. 
This is Jay Greenberg. On behalf of the FBI, Executive Assistant Director Terry Wade, Director Christopher Ray, I am the chief of our violent crime section, which manages all of the training and investigations, partnerships, and outreach that we provide for all Indian Country Matters nationwide. It is an honor to be representing the FBI here today, and I look forward to your input on how we can do better to serve your needs. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, the acting director for the Office of Violence Against Women at the Department of Justice, Laura Rogers, representing Laura Rogers today is Frances Cook. Good afternoon, all. My name is Frances Cook, and I am representing the head of the Office on Violence Against Women, Laura Rogers, um, who sends her deep regrets that she could not be here today. She asked me to share that she is so appreciative that the president included her on this task force. Um, she feels that OVW brings uh, a particular perspective to this work of making the connection between domestic and sexual violence, uh, including sex trafficking and the disappearance or murder of Native people. We have heard heartbreaking stories at our annual government-to-government -government consultations on violence against women in tribal communities stories about the connection between escalating domestic violence and homicide, as well as the disappearance of Native women and girls related to sex trafficking. We are so grateful to be a part of the critical work of this task force, and I am pleased to be here today on Laura's behalf. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Uh, it's come to my attention that the audio seems to be uh, cutting in and out, and uh, Operator, can you please explain uh, how to use the app? Um, yes, if they just exit, if you're having audio issues coming through your speakers, if you would just um, exit the room, re-enter, and when prompted, put your phone number in, the um, you will get a, a call from a 404 number, and the audio will come clearly through your phone line. So uh, in order to hear clearly, I guess, uh, folks will need to use the app and the operator will call you uh, from the app to your, your phone number and the sound quality is significantly better. Yes, that's uh, moving, okay. Um, moving on to the remaining task force members, uh, it is my honor to introduce Charles Addington, Deputy Bureau Director for BIA Office of Justice Services. Charlie? Well, good afternoon, everybody, and thank you, Assistant Secretary Sweeney. Uh, like Tara said, my name is Charles Addington. I'm the director for the BIA Office of Justice Services, who uh, we oversee the uh, public safety. Uh, programs uh, throughout Indian Country, and we're just so pleased uh, to be a part of this task force and to uh, collaborate with our uh, other partners at the Department of Justice, HHS, and the FBI uh, work hand-in-hand -hand with our uh, tribal law enforcement staff and the other uh, supporting uh, programs uh, throughout Indian Country to try to address this very critical uh, issue that we're going to talk about here today. And we look forward to hearing uh, a lot of good feedback from the panel members, and uh, thank you for being here today. Thank you. And, uh, again, my my honor to introduce uh, Trent Shores, U.S. Attorney for the Northern District of Oklahoma. Mr. Shores. Alito Chimachukma, my name is Trent Shores. I am a citizen of the Choctaw Nation of Oklahoma. I am the United States Attorney in, in Northern Oklahoma, but also have the honor of chairing the Native American Issue Subcommittee for the Attorney General. Uh, I look very, very much so forward to hearing the comments today. I am particularly interested to hear whether the issue of missing and murdered Indigenous persons is impacting uh, both women and girls and men and boys. I'm curious to hear uh, from tribal leaders about what the law enforcement situation is like on the ground to be able to receive those reports 
and follow up on those investigations in a timely manner. I look forward to hearing your comments and uh, taking them to heart. Thank you, Mr. Shores. Uh, and a woman who needs no introduction, many of you know uh, Jeannie Hovland, Deputy Assistant Secretary for Native American Affairs uh, and Task Force Member. Uh, Jeannie? Thank you. And Petu Wash Day Madakiapi, Ken K Wash Day and a Petu Zapi, Isanteriate Matahansto. Good afternoon, my relatives. I greet you with a good heart. Jeannie Hovland. Uh, I am Commissioner of the Administration for Native Americans and also Deputy Assistant Secretary of Native American Affairs at the Administration for Children and Families. And I'm a proud member of the Flanders Santee Sioux Tribe. I'm so honored to be here with folks from the White House, with Assistant Secretary Sweeney and our Operation Lady Justice Task Force members from Interior and Department of Justice. And I so appreciate the President's support on this important issue and making this a priority of his administration. To the tribal leaders and members on the phone, I want to say thank you so much for your years of advocacy to remember and to bring justice and healing to families and communities who have experienced the tragedy of a missing or murdered relative. Your voices have been heard and we are here to work in partnership to help bring our relatives home and keep our communities safe. I'm grateful that this task force has broadened this issue to include the Department of Health and Human Services so we can have a holistic approach, which is required if we really want to have a positive impact. I look forward to hearing from our tribal leaders on the phone today on how we at HHS can support a community-based prevention, intervention, and healing strategy. Thank you for this opportunity. Tadani Apishto. Thank you, Commissioner Hovland. These next slides will provide an update on the accomplishments uh, so far with respect to the task force work project. Uh, to date, the task force has held uh, eight listening sessions and will continue to aggressively consult with Indian country. Uh, the information and the recommendations that we gather from the sessions will help guide the task force in developing protocols and recommendations. The task force has launched a website that will be regularly updated on important aspects of our activity, including progress to date on upcoming events. We've developed several work groups which have been aggressively collaborating on the various aspects of the charges of the task force, and you can see the various work groups uh, represented on the slide. We are also maximizing our efforts by coordinating with other federal task forces and commissions, such as the ones listed here. The presidential report due dates are, are represented on this slide by November 26, 2020. We are charged with submitting a report, a progress report to the president that uh, highlights the activities and accomplishments thus far, as well as recommendations for future action. And then in November 2021, the task force will submit its final report to the president. Now, to help guide discussions during our listening sessions and consultations, we've developed several key questions geared towards proposing potential solutions. I believe that those who registered for this event uh, also received a copy of this PowerPoint, and so you will have those guiding questions uh, for you. Uh, and, and finally, uh, in in an effort to continue to hear from Indian country, uh, we have a dedicated email address established uh, for uh, individuals to provide the task force with comments and recommendations. And you can see that here at Operation Lady Justice at usdoj.gov. Uh, you can also find, again, additional information on the website. And so uh, if you are offering testimony, 
uh, and your audio is connected by a phone, here are the directions for how you can get in the queue to provide comments. Uh, if you are connected via the computer, uh, you will see that there is a, an icon at the top where you can raise your hand. And uh, raise your hand, you will be put into the queue uh, for comments. If you would like to provide comments in a chat format, there is that option uh, on, on your screen where you can submit questions and uh, we will have the executive director, Marsha Good, uh, also monitoring that box for additional information. So at this time, the, the lines are open for uh, comments. So if anyone would like to speak, um, just ra as she said, uh, just raise your hand and you will be called in, the <clears throat> in that order. Is there anyone interested in providing comments at this time? Please raise your hand. Uh, but in the meantime, uh, as we're waiting for people to familiarize themselves with this program, uh, we've heard I, we've heard during prior listening sessions uh, from tribes who have no law enforcement at all uh, the the need to mobilize partnerships and develop uh, a workable framework. And so as you're listening to the comments today, uh, that is a topic that is very important to the task force uh, and would encourage you if uh, you are not providing comments on it today to submit and include that topic in the, your um, written remarks. Are there any uh, tribal leaders in the queue to speak? Um, I have Operator. Monty Pronk on the line right now. Monty, go ahead. Yes, can you hear me okay? Yes, we can. Yes. Yes. Uh, yeah, I, I'm, I'm with the Malai Band of Ojibwe here in Minnesota, and uh, I am a, uh, a native father of a uh, teenage daughter who was sex who was trafficked for almost a year, and uh, very traumatic to our family with that time. Uh, she was recovered alive, uh, but very traumatically, physically and emotionally uh, damaged uh, at that time. She was uh, missing from uh, 14 and a half to almost 16 years of age. Uh, uh, luckily, never left Minnesota, uh, but just uh, as a uh, native father who experienced the um, struggles of working with off-reservation services, who felt that uh, uh, young teenage girls were not a high priority to them um, was a very big struggle uh, in the fact that um, I look at, uh, I've been, I'm in public safety myself for 30, 32 years, and it was really because of my fellow brethren in uniform who I could reach out to um, that really helped to bring her back home um, alive uh, but uh, but uh, very uh, very damaged. She's 23 now, and you know still struggling with the results of that. Um, the one thing I have uh, looked at, and uh, and got to be on this on this call, is you know the resources that are out there and how you know many agencies see our missing Native girls, you know, as really not worth their time. And I think that is something that I have heard from other uh, par uh, Native parents of, of girls who were missing or or trafficked was that first contact is really what could either, um, you know, bring the information forward or not. But also in, in mine, I was very honored and really my saviors 
with two organizations, which was a Patty Wedling Foundation here in Minnesota, as well as the National Missing and um, Children's Network, uh, who were always probably more on top of things for getting the word out when my daughter uh, went missing. Um, and when hope kind of faded away after almost close to a year, and uh, Patty Wedling was a very excellent resource for myself, just verbalizing what the realities were. Um, and for myself, it was pretty much planning her funeral. Um, but luckily, uh, a tip found her uh, found her alive at a residence in St. Paul, Minnesota. Um, I, from that, I guess as a, uh, as a as a native father of who has a daughter who's been through this and working in public safety, um, I always felt that. Uh, through my mentors and a lot of uh, collaboration, and I really appreciate the fact that our Chief Executive Melody Benjamin was in that photograph, and she had just been a wonderful uh, mentor for uh, what she has done for the Mille Lacs Band and for all of us who are here, are her employees for building relationships and bridges that um, many states have what is called fusion centers, and that to me is one of those under-tapped resources, I think, for Indian country, which many of us have always wished there were more of a tribal presence in those uh, fusion centers across the United States. So if a uh, young Native woman goes missing or murdered or or lost, that could be reported to those fusion centers as soon as possible, either through law enforcement or through tribal advocacy. Because sometimes in Indian country, um, our tribal advocates who are really our, our unsung heroes um, are the ones who find out about uh, the uh, the missing women and children in our communities sometimes the fear of law enforcement is one they'd rather talk to a advocate about their missing family member than going going to the criminal justice system uh, with that one. I know that uh, the FBI does have a Citizens Academy, and I know in Minnesota we have talked about, through my experiences, of why couldn't there be an Indian Country Academy similar to the FBI Citizens Academy to help educate uh tribal communities about these situations in a good way and understand the process of when these things happen to families, the historical trauma that is, that is caused by this or added to their own lives uh, with that one, what a prosecution looks like, what an investigation looks like, you know, and to under help them understand because when you're in crisis, uh, things don't happen quickly. Um, so I hope that with this group, you know, and I've told some of my federal resources I would love to be, you know, uh, if I could be a resource as a native father who's in public safety for, for 32 years, who has a daughter who was missing but found alive, which I know is a rarity, um, to most of the uh, most of the stories you have heard, you know, maybe that maybe I could be a resource possibly, and you know, in that way, have having lived having lived through this situation myself. I always hope that the fusion centers across the U.S. could be a better resource tool for Indian country if there was a tribal liaison assigned to those to get those to get those reports and the words out as soon as possible. So if a Native woman is being trafficked and let's say goes to another state and a traffic stop happens and uh, thank you so much for your comments. As I had mentioned in the beginning of our um, presentation, the program that we're using uh, will automatically mute the lines uh, after the three-minute mark. Uh, at this time, I would like to call on first Jessica Hart and Jay Greenberg uh, for just some feedback to Mr. Frank. Thanks, Tara. Um, I just want to say, you know, thank you for sharing with us. Um, my heart, you know, really goes out to you. I appreciate you stepping up and being here today and sharing your experience, and I'm you know, so glad that you um, are, you know, one of the few people I think out there that, you know, your daughter came back, and I'm so happy, you know, that you were reunited with your daughter. Um, I think your perspective is really useful to this task force, um, kind of the situation that you and your family have gone through, and then your public, it sounds like public safety experience. I think um, this is something that the task force would like to look into further, the Fusion Center, and I know you were kind of got cut off at the end, but you started mentioning tribal liaisons. And I know um, we have specific grants for tribal liaisons. Um, I think that's something we could look into further. So I really, you know, appreciate your experience and think you have some really great ideas that we'd like to look at further. Um, I can hand it over. I think um, one of my other colleagues wanted to share some specific, yeah. specific, specific 
Mr. Greenberg. Hi, Mr. Franz. Jay Greenberg with the FBI. Thank you very much for sharing your story. As an investigator, when I first joined the FBI, um, I actually worked human trafficking matters, and I saw the, the sort of the trail of destruction that trafficking leaves through families and communities. I will I will echo the comments that I'm very happy your daughter has come back home, although uh, with a heavy heart as a parent, um, knowing that your family has been altered in a very terrible way for the rest of your life because of that experience. So um, let me just you know, deeply sympathize with you um, for a moment about the experience that your daughter went through and that your family went through. In terms of the partnership with NICMIC, I am pleased to report, in addition to overseeing Indian country, I also oversee all of our human trafficking and crimes against children investigations. And we are the only federal agency who has a formal standing footprint with NICMIC, and we help them parse through their leads, both on the crimes against children and, and missing children um, areas to help farm those leads out. So it is very, very important to our mission. It's very important to the stability of the country and everybody who's here uh, in our country um, and and here uh, on all the lands that we have uh, that we continue to execute that well. So I, I'd like to just thank you for sharing your story and also for your comments about the opportunity perhaps to expand some of the liaison that we do within Native American communities. Uh, to sort of mimic what we do with Citizens Academy. Uh, for those of you not familiar with it, in Citizens Academy, we bring a group of citizens into the FBI generally once a week for six to eight weeks, depending on each office and the program they offer there, and talk about all of the investigative equities uh, that we perform. That's certainly something that we would be open to expanding into Indian country as a possibility, and I will follow up with all of our major offices who service the Indian country lands and see uh, the, the possibility and the viability of that going forward. So thank you for sharing that. Thank you. Uh, operator, are there additional comments? Yes, next, next speaker? we have um, Danielle. Um, Danielle, your line is open. Thank you very much. Are you able to hear me clearly? Yes, we yes. Are. go ahead. Thank you. My name is Daniel Amick and I'm a member of the Red Lake Band of Chippewa Indians. I agree and I think it's a great idea that everyone is gathering. Um, I'd like to see some focus on communication. As the gentleman mentioned, a lot of times people don't realize what the actual process is when there's a crime that's committed. Um, especially when it happens on the reservation. Um, my mother, elderly mother, was a victim of a sexual assault, but the communication between ourselves, and I'm not currently on the reservation. I live in another state. So it was kind of confusing when we were going back and forth trying to communicate with the um, people that were assigned to my mother's case. Um, so I just would like to see some improvement and some type of possible additional training to go on with that, whether that's, you know, an individual um, speaking directly with the family members from the FBI and the tribal member or, or, or and the tribe. I just think it would be very beneficial to the uh, victims of the family so that they can understand what the process is, if that makes sense. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Uh, just as a reminder, when you look at the executive order, um, it, it charges the task force with precisely that uh, in terms of improving the response to various challenges, including investigation and communication, uh, developing the appropriate protocols to assist families and victims uh, with the multi-jurisdictional uh, challenges that we fi often find in Indian country. Uh, I don't know, Jeannie, Commissioner Hovland, if you wanted to provide any information about the toolkit that HHS has developed. Um, thank you. And yes, absolutely, I agree. Uh, education and communication to families and also to the federal agencies learning from lived experience for those that have had the unfortunate 
situation of having so many human trafficked or victimized. We need to learn from you also, so thank you for sharing, and I'm sorry for you and your family that you've had experience this. We have at the Administration for Native Americans partnered with the Office on Trafficking in Persons, which is a department within Department of Health and Human Services, and developed a free online toolkit um, called Combating Human Trafficking uh, Native Youth Toolkit, and it's free. You can download it, distribute it. It's a good way to have a conversation about what is human trafficking, what do you do if you identify it, and how do you respond to it. And in partnership with Assistant Secretary Sweeney, we trained several of the Bureau of Indian Education staff and also staff from Johnson O'Malley Program so that they can, one, be aware of what human trafficking is, um, and teach this to their students and start those tough conversations, but also working with Director Addington and how we can also bring this to law enforcement. And so we have a lot taking place. We have a lot of work to do, and we do want to have our approach on this task force be from lived experience um, from Native communities. So we'd be happy to follow up with you and, and visit further about this and, and use your insight on this. So thank you. Thank you. Operator, next speaker. Okay, next we have uh, Kristen Welch. Kristen, go ahead. You're on the line. Postal Natsumatam on the Tech Camel Pashu Nikotam. My English name is Kristen Welch. I'm a descendant of the Menominee Nation, and I work for the Indigenous Blood Nonprofit, Mini Chronicum. I am the lead organizer for Women's Leadership Cohort MMIW. And we're currently working with Wisconsin DOJ to move the MMIW task force forward here in Wisconsin. So some, my question is, how are you actively seeking out um, families and survivors to guide the work? But also, how are you engaging Indigenous-led grassroots leaders in the work as well? Uh, this is Commissioner Hoplin. Um Currently, at the Administration for Native Americans and Office on Trafficking in Persons, we had a first-ever Native uh, American cohort on human trafficking um, with providers and survivors of human trafficking who are going to be issuing a white paper on how we can address. And I know human trafficking, you know, we want to see how much that plays into murdered and missing indigenous uh, people. Um, so that is one area that we are looking at, and we'll be using their white paper as a guidance for us. Um, as well as uh, reaching out through community uh, meetings and our listening sessions. That is part of the what we'll be doing from HHS on education and communication. Kristen, this is Marcia Good. I'm the executive director of the task force, which means that I'm responsible for kind of the day-to-day -day operations. Um, another thing that the task force is doing to reach out to some of the um, tribal grassroots organizations is we're putting together, um, so to start with, some webinars to work with the tribes who are already working in this area so we can all coordinate efforts. We're doing the same thing with some of the state task forces as well, and then trying to, to coordinate and communicate amongst all of the groups, the the tribal um, work that's already being done and then coordinating that with our work and the state work because there are many tribes who've already done a number of really good things in this area and are, are you know, a long ways down the line um, in their own communities. And so if you could um, get me your contact information, I would love to visit with you about that. Um, so that's kind of for the grassroots section. For um, families, we're still working on, on kind of the best way to be able to do that. You know, in-person sessions obviously are the best way to be able to do it because it's such a sensitive topic. Um, and with the, you know, the lack of ability to travel right now, we're kind of struggling with that. But we are, you know, thinking about how we can do that and do that best so that families can um, discuss this with each other and with us. And we will definitely be back in touch when we have something um, along those lines worked out. Thank you. 
Thanks, Marsha. Um, this is Jessica. It looks like Tara's phone is having some difficulties. Um, operator, do we want to maybe move on to the next person and hopefully Tara will be able to call in by then? Um, yes, I'm waiting for, I have Jamie Moran, um, just waiting for that line to be picked up. Perfect. Okay, Jamie, your line is open. Go ahead. Jamie, are you with us? I am. I was just able to log in. Um, actually, I had several okay. questions. Um, well, actually, let, first let me introduce myself. Jamie Moran, I'm the program director for the Victim Services Program for the Sioux St. Marie Tribe of Chippewa Indians in the Upper Peninsula of Michigan. The first question I had is, when will tribal justice systems be hearing from the U.S. attorney offices who received the funding to hire the MMIP coordinators? Um, my second question is, is the task force intended to encompass collaborative law enforcement networking that includes federal partners in instances of MMIW cases that occur off of trust land? And my last question is, what is being done with regard to state statutes and individual law enforcement agency policies that prohibit the acceptance of missing person complaints for X number of hours? So this is Marcia. Could I ask, um, Shannon Pizzoni is on the line. Shannon is a tribal liaison in Oklahoma. And they just started their um, missing, their MMIP coordinator, I believe, starts next Monday. Shannon, could you talk just a little bit about kind of the, the process um, for the first question that she had about the contact with um, the new MMIP coordinators and U.S. attorney's offices? I know we also have other U.S. Yes. attorneys who are on this call, and we can also hook those folks up. Sure. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, I know that Montana has theirs, has had theirs in place. Um, theirs was actually done a little differently. It wasn't run through that program. So theirs has been on, has been on the ground. Ours starts Monday. And, um, I, honestly, they would have started earlier. I, you know, we just got with COVID, a lot of things had to slow down. So I suspect that several of the other, um, MMIP coordinators will be coming on in the next, this month. I, I suspect that process is, should be right behind us. Um, so I suspect that those will be out, the outreach uh, should start picking up pretty quickly. Um, you know, clearly we're, we're concerned about the, about COVID and, and how much in person we're going to do, but I think there will be, certainly we will ease into that. Um, the other question, those individuals, like, for instance, the Oklahoma one, we there's three districts in Oklahoma that our MMIP coordinator is covering all three districts. Um, I think there's one in New Mexico, for instance, and, and so they should be kind of reaching out. Um, and then they will also work together to kind of standardize, and I use that term, understanding that. Everyone, every tribe is different. Every state is different. So there will not be like a standard, but there, but there will be some things that we've got to look at. Um, as to, for instance, in Oklahoma, we have, we, Oklahoma did just pass a law that there is no waiting period. Um, I don't know, th there's no law that states has a waiting period in any state that I'm aware of. It's usually a policy. Um, and honestly, I, I think it's kind of one of those policies that may not be kind of unwritten. So I think that we're seeing some efforts out there to try to affirmatively acknowledge that those, that these arbitrary time periods don't exist, that instead what we want to look at is the situation that's going on. It's different for everyone. Um, if this person is always at this place at this time and they don't show up, then then that is cause for an immediate re report. And so that's what, for instance, the Oklahoma law does. I know some other states had enacted those laws. 
and um, hopefully that would be something uh, that we'd look to, to to get on a on a national level. Marcia, was there okay, anything else you needed you. me to cover? I'm sorry. No, I think that's good. Um, Andrew Burge is on the line. He's one of our U.S. attorneys. Um, and if we could open up his line, and he might be able to address the issue about contacting U.S. attorneys and MMIP coordinators. Andrew, are you on? I believe I'm here. Can you hear me? Yes. Ah, excellent. Uh, yes, our uh, uh, MMIP coordinator is going to be starting July 1. Uh, the delays are unfortunately related to uh, uh, the pandemic we've been experiencing, uh, but we do look forward to having uh, him on the ground. An experienced former agent comes recommended to us uh, from some formal tribal leaders as well. Uh, and some of the issues that have been asked about are exactly what we uh, anticipate he will be looking at. So he will be uh, already, we've been talking to him about plans for meeting with the tribes uh, this summer if possible, but we want to be sensitive about um, uh, in-person meetings. But definitely uh, the inquiries will begin, and uh, we do want to understand uh, some of these underlying issues and come up with uh, better lines of communication. Thank you. Uh, any other additional questions? Operator, next speaker. I do not have any anyone else with their hand raised at the moment. Okay. Uh, I see that there was a question asked in the comments section about the improvement on cellular and internet access in rural communities. Uh, it's a major problem if women who are endangered are unable to contact emergency services, and I absolutely agree with that. Uh, at Indian Affairs, we have a national tribal broadband grant uh, program that is uh, about to close. Applications are due, I believe, June 12 or 13, uh, and it's to, to provide um, tribal governments an opportunity or, or financial assistance to conduct feasibility studies for uh, broadband infrastructure, especially in our rural communities. Uh, Charlie Addington, uh, can you also talk about the, the BIA OJS uh, phone app that you have developed? You, you bet. Well, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, yeah, the Bureau of Indian Affairs, Office of Justice Services, you know, found we kept hearing from uh, tribal communities that there was no way to uh, for community members to provide tips to directly to law enforcement. So the BIA uh, uh, Division of Drug Enforcement began looking at how can we set up something that is very simple, uh, a phone app, to where if you've got a smartphone, you can download an app. And you can just uh, go to that app and actually uh, provide a tip to law enforcement directly through that app. So we worked with the um, uh, contractors to make sure uh, we had a system set up uh, that would work for us. And you can go on any smartphone, whether it be an a iPhone or a uh, Android phone, and download our app, which is called BI Tips. And you can actually go onto that app once you download it and send tips directly to a law enforcement officer or a special agent. Um, and they will actually send that, assign that to whoever is in the area of, uh, where the crime or the tip is coming in at. And what, and then, but you can actually be, remain anonymous or you can actually, uh, communicate directly with the agent that it's assigned to. So, uh, it's a very good tool uh, for folks to be able to provide tips and help law enforcement uh, start being uh, uh, better informed and uh, respond to these crimes in a, in a much quicker manner. So, Charlie, how can they find the the link or the URL for the app? Yeah, you just go on to, to the app uh, store on your smartphone. And just go to there and type in BIA tips into the search, 
and it will bring up a icon that has a round uh, VIA Office of Justice Services seal, and then you just download that app. And then once you download that on your phone, you can just go directly to it and open the app and provide tips to law enforcement. Thank you. Uh, operator, are there additional uh, speakers in the queue? Yes, next we have Holly Mackey. Holly, you're on the line. Hi, um, I don't know if y'all can hear me. Um, Holly Mackey uh, from the Raven Project and North Dakota State University, enrolled member of the Northern Cheyenne. And I, first of all, I just want to thank y'all for the work that you're doing. I think that, that it's really important, and, and we've had the opportunity over the last few years to work with a number of FBI analysts and agents um, in our region who've done a phenomenal job. But it kind of gets back into the grassroots question in, in some ways, right? And and I see all of the task forces in the states with all of the, the legislation coming out to identify scope of problem and and to think about all of these these issues. But it seems as if everything is still very much top down, where if law enforcement is a perceived problem for an Indian country, um, law enforcement is now being tasked to fix the problem. And I don't see where the advocates for MMIT have any authority. Right, so so we've given them access, but we haven't given them any authority to to work on behalf of victims, which does a disservice, really, to the people who are trying to affect change in those areas. And similarly, right, um, and I've, I've talked with a few people at DOJ about this. You know, we've become increasingly uh, concerned about data and the ways that data is um, both unavailable or marginally available, or you know, if you're a victim or the family member, you can access more information through NamUs, but NamUs is really short-sighted in the ways that it provides any sort of data that would help scholars such as myself working on this end think about prevention or intervention efforts. So I'm, I'm curious what it is the task force is going to do to address more of the prevention side of things, because by the time we get to the law enforcement side of it, we've already lost people. Well, we're not talking about juvenile justice. We're not talking about child protective services. We're not talking about social conditions, right? And, and often framing it as trafficking makes it an issue of otherness, where we know that a lot of these things are happening in our communities because our communities simply don't have the officers or the support, the social service support, the housing, any of the things that um, really get bound up in the federal shackles right, through the reservation systems and the IRA government. So I'm, I'm curious how people are thinking about these issues in particular, um, having worked for a number of years now and, and still finding that despite the work that everybody's doing, like those of us who are doing the work remain on the outside when we have task forces like this constructed. Thank you for your questions you raised some extremely important points, and uh, when the discussions uh, began about how the federal government was going to respond to uh, missing and murdered American Indians and Alaska Natives, it became apparent to so many uh, stakeholders within the administration uh, and those that are on this call that data and data deficiency was something that really needed to be addressed. Uh, and so um, I'd like to turn the uh, provide, or I would like to turn the floor over to uh, Charles Addington and to Trent Shores to, uh, to address some of the, the questions regarding data deficiency and the recognition that the task force has for um, why this is important. Charlene? Yeah, well, yeah, well, thank you, Tara. Yes, uh, you know, the data, we, we have been uh, uh, looking at how, how can we do, get a system to, to uh, put in place to get the accurate data? How can we find out exactly what the problem is in each one of our communities? And, you know, prior to uh, utilizing the NamUs system, which is a great system uh, to uh, input all of our data into and be able to track those, uh, and, and the fine folks at NamUs worked uh, hand in hand with us to develop some tribal affiliation specific uh, drop down categories so we could actually track uh, what 
uh, missing persons, whether they lived on the reservation, whether they uh, come up missing from the reservation, or if it, they were off the reservation, so that way we could uh, actually track the numbers better. Uh, and we've been working with them to try to get that system um, up and running to where all of our uh, tribal law enforcement programs are entering all of their uh, missing person and uh, uh, murdered cases into the system. Uh, so we've been working very uh, hand in hand with our tribal law enforcement departments to try to get them to to do that, since it is a man or a uh, voluntary uh, reporting system. Uh, but we think once we are able to get all of our cases that we've identified uh, through law enforcement and through the community, uh, we do hear from community members that tell us, you know, hey, I've got a loved one that's come up missing, and we don't know if it's been reported to law enforcement or not. And that's one of the things that we're going to do uh, as we develop and stand up these cold case task forces uh, to address uh, missing persons and cold cases uh investigations is looking at how do we get all of that data from the community members and from law enforcement and get it all into a system so you know exactly what the problem is. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Schwartz, did you have anything to add? Okay. Uh, I, I appreciate the the question also about preventative measures. When, when you look at the executive order in Section 4, uh, there is a subsection, I believe it is um, C or D, uh, where it calls for the task force to develop and to execute uh, an education and outreach campaign uh, for those com com communities that are most affected, uh, and it, it, it calls for the task force to identify how we can reduce uh, those types of crimes. And so your suggestions uh, on prevention and data capture are certainly um, well noted. So thank you for that. Uh, operator, uh, next speaker, please. Okay, next I have Rachel Carr. Rachel, go ahead, you're on the line. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can, go ahead. Hello? Oh, yeah. Yes, go um, ahead. Hi, everyone. My name is Rachel Carr. I'm with the um, United Three Fighters Against Violence for Michigan's Tribal Domestic Violence and Sexual Assault Coalition. And I just had a question um, following up from Jamie Moran's earlier question regarding the task force intention to include all law enforcement partners, um, including the, the federal partners, for MMIW cases that occur off trust land, um, because we know that a good majority of American Indian and Alaska Natives live off trust land. And, and so, can you reframe your question? I, I mean, when you're so for the federal or for the um, you know, all law enforcement to collaborate when when an MMIW happens, um, you know, and to involve federal partners, is it a requirement or is it the task force um, belief that they're you know that the person that's gone missing has to be uh, missing from Indian country specifically or, or reservation or trust land? Or would that be Thank not you. a requirement? Oh. Yep. I can. So I want to turn, uh, I'll, I'll turn it over to Shannon Cazzoni, uh to provide some background. Um, yes, and I would say not necessarily. And, and that's something, I mean, certainly we want the federal partners involved, all partners, tribal, state, um, federal, because as, as you've just mentioned, one of the issues we have is this crossing of lines. But sometimes those crossing of lines give us a federal jurisdiction, even when they're not on Indian country. So in, in events of domestic violence, for instance, we have the VAWA statutes that may kick in. 
if there's um, uh, trafficking or drug, even drug trafficking to some degree, we might be able to get a federal hook to be able to focus on that. Having said that, there's still going to be options, uh, for instance, the FBI, and, and, and they can probably answer that, their response teams, BIA's response teams, through certain um, either cross-commissioning or through through their abilities to be involved in those searches. So um, I don't think it's – I mean, we, what we want to do is expand people's thinking on that and being able to – um, think outside of the box in how, what ways can we encourage all involvement? Yeah, hi, this is Dave hey. hey. again. Sure. Hello. Hey, and Charlie, you may want to, uh, you may want to come in here after me as well, but, you know, great question. And as you know, the jurisdiction for the FBI in particular when it comes to missing people is different in each state and it's the, the jurisdiction is just incredibly complex. So there are some states where we have no jurisdiction um, on tribal lands, off tribal lands. There are some states where it's mixed or where we have secondary jurisdiction. But in the case of um, missing people, when we focus on um, what we can do and where we have jurisdiction, we will move forward with all available resources to try and bring somebody home who is reported missing. Um, and that is consistent with how we have operated in the past and how we, we will operate today and will continue to operate in the future. Yeah, thanks so much, Jay. Hey, this is Charlie as well. Just, just, to, just to add on to that, we've we just seen a, a perfect example of this. You know, in the past, we've had, uh, you know, there's been issues with uh, the coordination of uh, missing person uh, responses from uh, law enforcement uh, agencies, you know, even that border each other. You know, the, say the uh, off-reservation law enforcement and the, and the tribal law enforcement that, that border each other. But there's been, uh, you know, s some areas of just lack of coordinating in the, in the beginning and a very good example of this is we just had an unfortunate case uh, months back in Montana, and the uh, local sheriff's office actually contacted uh, the BIA, Office of Justice Services, and the FBI to come in immediately to help them uh, with the search of a missing uh, Native female up there. And uh, I can tell you immediately uh, the BIA and the FBI uh, responded in force out there and work hand in hand with those tribal and uh, county officers uh, to bring that to a resolution and do the searches and everything to find that missing uh, female. So it is getting better. We hear what you're saying, and I think we everyone recognizes there's been a gap there, but we're doing a lot to really uh, close those gaps up. Thank you. Uh, operator, and uh, next speaker. Next, I have um, Elizabeth Carr. Elizabeth, your line is open. Go ahead. Hi, good afternoon. This is Liz Carr with NAWRC. I just have a few questions um, to follow up from the conversations that have taken place earlier this afternoon. So the first is thinking about the function of the MMIP coordinators. How are communities being made of, aware of their existence when they're finally onboarded? And then how do community members engage with them? Is there going to be a website, a phone number, an instructional guide for folks to be able to access? Um, just thinking about, um, you know, the, the onboarding process and what that looks like in terms of folks being able to access those coordinators. And then in the term, in terms of the app that Mr. Addington mentioned, how is that tool being promoted across Indian country? And is there a coordinated outreach plan um, to promote that tool in any way. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we will start with uh, Department of Justice regarding the MMIP coordinators and then uh, over to Charlie Addington to talk about the BIA OJS app. Department of Justice. Either Jay or 
uh, Shannon or Jessica. Yeah, this is Jessica. I, um, I think, you know, communication is obviously going to be a key piece of this, and every U.S. attorney's office is obviously um, going to operate in a different way depending on, you know, their relationship. Um, Shannon, I know, I think you guys had said you were just getting someone on board, um, the coordinator, or just about to. Can you all talk about maybe your um, plans, how to communicate that? Um, yes, our starts Monday. Um, I think Trent at the last uh, at the last meeting had given out her email address even, and I apologize. I don't know that I have it yet, um, so I will see what I can find. Um, but but yeah, they should be. You should be able to call the office and, and get a hold of them. Um, I you know again, it's going to be different for each each uh, U.S. Attorney's office, but. Our intention, at least in our office in Oklahoma, is that our MMIP coordinator, which is Patty Buell, will actually start reaching out. And again, I say going out, but that again will depend on kind of the comfort level of tribes. Um, and reaching out to those individuals, we've identified those, we tried to identify the people in our um, state that or have have groups in place to start with, and that's kind of where we'll reach out first. And then, um, you know, the, just showing up at, showing up and being part of the community and, and talking to people there, you will naturally find uh, the groups you need to find. But certainly they can call our office and, and ask for Patty Buell. Thank you. And yeah. to Director Addington? Yeah, just to follow up on the uh, the app, uh, what we did is we actually developed this initially for our Division of Drug Enforcement. So we've uh, developed it a couple of years ago, and now we we're in the process of expanding uh, that tip line. And we've actually put it out on social media. We have it up on our Facebook pages and out on social media. And then we've also put flyers up uh, out in the communities uh and the platform is through TIP411. So TIP411 has actually helped us develop all those tools and push those out to the communities as well. Uh, and then we'll be developing additional tip lines and those type of things as we move uh, down the road on our cold case task forces. Uh, so we'll be putting out tip lines for those cases as well as uh, the reward lines and different things as we uh, stand up our cold case task forces. Thank you. Operator, next. Speaker? On the line now we have Renee. Renee, your line is open. Yeah, I had a quick question. Um, when it was mentioned that um, people can be able, will be able to access a uh, app, um, here in Southern California, we have um, numerous places that, that pop up uh, within the community and just for the general public that qualify as low income, um, would phones also be provided to those in need on reservations so they have the opportunity to have access to the app? Well, there, there's, this is Charlie, there's not any, any type of phones that, that come with the app, but there is some services out there now. Uh, matter of fact, I just got to, just spoke with one yesterday uh, with track phone where they're actually putting there's federal programs out there to assist uh, uh, tribal members uh, if they can't afford a phone uh, to either uh, report uh, crimes or or those type of things and it's a really low low cost if you go through some of these programs that they had to have out there so that's something uh, that we're looking into to see if we can uh, some of those programs that are available so we can get the word out to tribal communities to where folks that can't afford a full phone uh, bill, they're able to afford a uh, these really reduced rates uh, so they have a phone with so many minutes and so many uh, gigabytes of data on them. Thank you. Uh, any further questions? 
I have um, Kristen Welch. Kristen, your line is open. Go ahead. Um, hello again. So I just had some questions about um, what are you doing to examine like the root causes of MMIW, like the settler-imposed policies that diminish tribal rights to self-determine. So tribes have the right to create their own codes, you know, against human trafficking, against resource extraction, but oftentimes, like through decisions like the Oliphant decision, there's very limited sovereignty and the ability to enact and uphold those rights to self-determine. And even in VAWA, there's um, there are some protections, but not enough. So what are you doing to examine those issues as, like, preventative measures and looking at settler policy as root causes of MMIW? And also, are you examining the issue of resource extraction, like the KXL pipeline, like Line 3, like Line 5, Novak 40 here in Wisconsin, where cases of violence against Indigenous women are increased by 70% because of man camps, and how are you going to support tribes in the rights to self-determine through that? Thank you for your question. Uh, you raised some very compelling points. I want to point you to the executive order uh, that in Section 4, it clearly defines uh, what the mission and the uh, topics that the task force uh, must report on to the president. Operator, next, next speaker. Okay, next we have Holly Mackey. Holly, go ahead, your line is open. Hi, thank you again. Um, I have uh, two questions. First, um, it you know it has occurred to me as somebody else was speaking. I was, I was wondering if or to what level, perhaps FBI or BIA or DOJ has considered the, their ability to increase the number of officers right, available to Indian Country. Because somebody had spoken about having a very positive response, but but we also know that, um, for example, juvenile offenders in North Central Montana are often not um, apprehended or taken in because there isn't a facility close enough that they can actually do that within the legal framework within the federal government or, you know, I know somebody was uh, said they were in charge of crimes against children, but, you know, we, we have uh, FBI agents, right, in Indian country who have, you know, 75 to 100 different cases that they're working at any given point in time and, and they're working so hard, right, to help us, but to just they're stretched so thin that I'm, I'm curious about that. And then I understand what the purpose of the task force is, right, and and delineating out the executive order. But just speaking to to the last speaker's comments, right, for for those of us who are are really doing this every day, it is problematic when we have issues like pipelines that contribute to trafficking, that contribute to MMIP. When we have an executive order from a president who then has an executive order permit to allow the KXL pipeline to get built as timely as possible through COVID. As, as deeming oil workers like essential workers so we can get the pipeline in the ground before the court hearing prevents it. Or, um, you know, similarly, just the extractive resources in general where we have, you know, the state of Montana current attorney general trying to advocate on behalf of putting pipelines in when we have data from the FBI linking man camps to trafficking from Bakken. So I'm, I'm really curious, A, like, are we going to have more law enforcement, right? That's just the basic question. But then, B, how are we going to reconcile this? Because it seems very disingenuous to have, on one hand, a task force to address these issues, but then everything else within the federal government working against and, and trying to to really facilitate all the conditions that lead to the crisis in the first place. Thank you for your, your questions, uh, Ms. Mackey. Uh, in terms of reconciling, one comment that I made in the beginning of the uh, session, the start of the session, was that these uh, sessions are being recorded uh, and will become part of the transcript. So uh, as we go through the comments that are provided, uh, as we look at the transcripts of our listening sessions and consultations, 
uh, the, the comments that are made here help guide those discussions and recommendations. Uh, so in terms of the task force and its capabilities, uh, raising those types of concerns through these fora uh, is an appropriate way to do that and one that um, is included in the record. So uh, I, I appreciate the comments that you're making. Uh, I want to turn it over to Jay Greenberg to talk about the FBI hiring issues uh, and then over to Charles Addington to add some additional background on BIA OJS hiring. Jay? Hi, Ms. Mackey. Thank you for your question and your comments. Uh, certainly, we take all the investigative responsibilities that are entrusted to us to heart, uh, nothing more so than Indian Country Matters. Um, we have uh, escalated the amount of staffing that we have in different Indian Country areas and offices, and that is a uh, the balancing of resources across offices and across uh, the violations that we cover within those offices and between our offices is something that is a constant source of analysis, and it's really kind of a moving, a constantly moving target about where we're putting our people. So I, I do appreciate that we are uh, regularly reevaluating how to staff our people, where to staff our people, and where to assign them to, and uh, certainly this remains a priority for the organization to continue to staff. Thank you. Yeah, Harvey? just to yeah, this is Charlie. Just add on to what uh, Jay said, same thing with the BIA Office of Justice Services. Uh, we just continue to make sure we're filling uh, vacant positions out there because that's one of the things uh, exactly what you what you say. You know, if you don't have boots on the ground out there, it is hard to make a uh, difference and actually uh, do proactive things to uh, – actually address these issues before they can occur and that's what we're doing right now we've been aggressively uh, filling uh, vacant law enforcement positions uh, throughout the country we have also reallocated uh, some of our resources to the higher crime areas uh, where we had previously uh, had different programs uh, we consolidated some of those and honed our, our skills in on uh, making sure that we've got the boots on the ground to answer these calls for service. And then we did add uh, additional um, special agents uh, for our Division of Drug Enforcement who also work border crimes, human trafficking, and some of the specialty investigations. We were able to add 20 new agents to our Division of Drug Enforcement over the last year and a half, and also uh, adding these new cold case task force special agents uh, throughout Indian country. There's going to be 10 of those that's going to be new that's coming on board as well to help us uh, work on these specific issues. So now you don't have your police officers on the ground who should be there responding to calls for service and doing uh, preventative uh, patrols and those kind of things, trying to address all of these other issues. We're going to have people, uh, new, new folks on the ground to help us. And then uh, Jessica Hart for DOJ. Yeah, thanks, Tara. Um, I want to say, too, Attorney General Barr visited uh, kind of remote areas of Alaska about this time last year and I think, you know, saw a lot of what you were talking about. Um, one of the remote villages we went to, you know, did not have any law enforcement officers, and he, you know, really saw this as, you know, a law enforcement emergency. And after returning from that um Trip, like I said, about this time last year, reallocated resources um, to through our Office of Justice programs and our community-oriented policing service programs um, to hire village public safety officers and village police officers. And so, I, you know, I think the Department of Justice and Attorney General Barr really sees this um, as an area that he would like to invest and has invested more resources. So thank you um, for bringing this up, and I think it's an area that we'll continue to work in. Thank you. Uh, are there any additional questions? Hello? No, that is what I have in here. Pardon? Hello, this is uh, have, Representative Roger Smith from Fond du Lac, Band of Lake Spirit, Chippewa. Okay, go ahead. Uh, I, I have uh, 
nearly 20 years in law enforcement and also a, a tribal council representative. Um, and I also sit on the Minnesota Governor's Task Force on MMIW. And through this process of COVID, it, it, it really, uh, I look at Fond du Lac as being, um, I thought, as, as good relationships with, with the different state agencies. Uh, but through COVID, it, it really shines the light on that, that we still need some work to do. Um, and then looking at um, how that is, is with, like, Department of Health and, and things of that nature. But it is on the data, to look at the data and, and how is that recorded and how is that um, given back to the tribal law enforcement and how that relationship these uh tribal law enforcement agencies have with counties. Um, there are some counties in Minnesota that uh, do not, um, I guess, cooperate with tribal law enforcement. It makes uh, policing difficult. And uh, but But of sharing that data with one another, how is the position uh, for the Minnesota office, going to improve those relationships, and uh, also looking at, like I said, on, on, on the other hand, with, with the different agencies, I look at like the Department of Corrections when they release people from their prisons, and we look at um, sex offenders, they can be released to any county, and some of those places that they're released. Uh, their listed addresses are within the confines of uh, the reservations of, and I'll just speak for Minnesota. Uh, we've had one that actually gave the address to our tribal casino as uh, his place of residence. And, um, but to look at, of, of they're releasing some of their sex offenders into our tribal uh, communities and without notifying the uh, the reservation or the, the tribal council or the tribal law enforcement uh, that this is going to be done. And I, and I believe that the tribes should have a say in it of where they can allow within their, their communities and Okay, thank you. Uh, Jay Greenberg, would you like to talk about the protocols uh, the task force is charged with uh, developing? Sure, Marsha, I'll be happy to. So as everybody knows, as part of the executive order on MMIP, one of the, uh, one of the outcomes that is expected is a set of protocols as it relates to how to jointly respond to and best serve allegations of missing or murdered uh, individuals. So uh, we are currently in the process with, we've been meeting with with, uh, with Ernie and with other members of the task force from Marshalls and BIA, and uh, if I start to list them, I'll miss them. So I won't list everybody individually, but just a number of federal partners, everybody looking at how we can expand what we bring to the search for missing or murdered people <clears throat> and enhance what we already do today. So there is a plan in place. We have been working diligently as a task force with Ernie and with all the other uh, members of MMIP to document what we do today and make sure that those are protocols that we can publish and then actively train all of our state, local, and other federal partners on so that we have a unified response uh, going forward, much better than we have in the past. Thank you. Uh, I also want to go back to Commissioner Hubland. Uh, the questions in the, the comments uh, box, as well as the, the questions raised, on the phone by several members regarding the extractive industry. Uh, Commissioner Hubland, can you talk about the Office on Trafficking in Persons and what they have uh, developed? Um, sure, and um, thank you. 
The Office on Trafficking in Persons is an agency within the Administration for Children and Families, and ANA, where I'm at, Administration for Native Americans. I apologize for our alphabet soup here. So we've partnered with the Office on Trafficking in Persons to really try to train on prevention, intervention, and healing of human trafficking victims and in their communities. And they have learned lessons from the extract industry and have talked about how we can partner in communities where uh, there could be any high risk of human trafficking. I mean, we hear about at Super Bowls. We hear at large events. So, I mean, business will continue, and there will be ways that people are going to find large events and susceptible uh, populations to, to perpetrate on. So learning lessons specific to certain industries is, is extraction industries is one of them that um, the Office on Trafficking and Persons has stated that they'd be willing to come and train communities on prevention. How do we keep our people safe from um, falling victim to human trafficking? And that's where um, if you want to follow up with myself, I can put you in touch with the Office on Trafficking and Persons and we can talk about training communities that have that concern. I hope that's helpful. Thank you. Uh, it looks like we are now on 3.30. Um, I just want to close the listening session with just a couple of comments about um, recognizing that many of us have family members uh, who are victims of domestic violence. Some are still missing and uh, others have been murdered. Uh, a reminder that these tensions uh, across the country uh, escalated uh, due to the riots. It's important that we all remember that violence isn't the answer. Um, I'm hearing reports of our men and women who are being called up to defend our communities uh, and that there are Native organizations who have been impacted by this violence. Um, I appreciate your willingness to work with this task force and to keep our work moving forward by engaging on this issue uh, and for being the community support for those who may be suffering. Uh, the only way I strongly feel to progress is by working together. And so I appreciate the partnership and the information that has been shared today. Uh, be safe and be well. Thank you.